How do you, you're 28 years old. How do you raise $250 million? How do you raise a quarter billion? And to be honest, a quarter billion sounds like a lot, but in our industry, it's not much, right? We thought we were going to make like 20K profit that week. And we had instead lost $50,000, you know, make like, you know, 50 grand, 100K, 200K. What is he now? He's like 20, 21. And he makes, he makes like 50 to 100K a month profit drop shipping. Welcome to episode 64 of New Money Talks. Oh, the money. Yeah, All right, right into, into it. Right into it. Awesome. We have the uh, the CEO, right? CEO. Right, yeah. Co-founder, CEO of Parker, Yassine. Really happy to have you here. This is yeah. a, a, an up-and-coming, obviously, killer um, payments platform, can we call it? Or like a credit card platform in the space? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to butcher it. You're, you're going to go into yeah, and make it sound all nice and, and everything. I've actually been very excited about this one. A lot of people have said to meet you. You have a lot of wisdom, have done a lot at a pretty young age, have raised hundreds of millions of dollars to this point. Um, so I'm before I even butcher it, I want you to kind of give your intro, tell people who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll just jump right into it. Yeah. Cool. So I'm just seeing I'm one of the co-founders of Parker. So Parker is basically a financial platform for e-commerce businesses. Um, we offer corporate cards, bank accounts, bill pay products, financial analytics, really any kind of financial product you can think of, we're building the most optimal version of it for e-com businesses. So in the same way that you go to Shopify to host your site, you go to Klaviyo for your email marketing, you'll come to Parker for all your financial needs. Most definitely. So what uh, what's different with e-commerce finances compared to another company? Yeah, so really the back story of the space is that there were two main players when we got started. There were Brex and Ramp. Brex and Ramp initially started off by serving venture back companies. So what's very different between a venture back startup and an e-com is that a venture back startup typically has no revenue when it's getting started and just has a bunch of cash versus an e-com business. Most e-com businesses, as you guys know, have to be profitable from day one. Yeah, correct. So when you're thinking of the financial products you're building for them, profitability is of the utmost importance. You have to so you have to build around that. You have to build around like basically cash flow optimization. So how do you get to the best cash conversion cycle? So the problems e-com businesses have versus other types of internet-based companies like venture, like a tech like company, SaaS like Parker, or SaaS companies yeah. are quite different, right? So if you think about what a lot of, you know, a lot of the branding around the other card companies is around spend management. But if you think about it, like, you guys have run e-coms before, spend management, collecting bills across hundreds of employees. It's not really problems we've had, right? Like what you care about on a day-to-day -day basis is more so like how profitable is this business? How much money are we making? And so that's what we want to help you solve. We want to build basically products that optimize for your profitability, which is not really something you see any other platform solve for today. And I'm really interested in this space though, because there's been so many players pop up, right? Yeah. Like there's just numbers and numbers of cards and not just in e-commerce, like across all industries, like kind of like- like Trucking. Literally, literally yeah. Anything, trucking, yeah. like to party. There's cards to like go party and stuff, like kind of yeah. like memberships into like clubs yeah. and all this type of shit, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm curious though, because like you started this five years ago. I would say, so five years ago is when we were in Y Combinator and okay. when we first had the idea, but we actually, we ended up pivoting a bunch, which we can go into, but oh, then we sure. came back to this in 2021. So 2021. I'd say we've been launched in market since April, May of 21. Okay. So say two years yeah, pretty much. Yeah, a little wild. over two years. I'm, yeah. I'm curious though, like how the hell do you build a credit card? Because like, is, it, it must not be yeah, that easy. Yeah, it's not. I always say that I got into this because I was very naive on how hard it would be and I was just super ambitious. And obviously, like if you're trying to build a banking platform, you're going after Amex, like all these like billion dollar Seriously, companies. Yeah. It's it's a pretty serious endeavor. Um, how do you build a card? Well, like for example, you wake up one morning and you're just like, I, I want to build a credit card. Like, do you call Visa? <laughs> like, what do you do first? You don't call Visa. You need to find... You basically need to find an issuing platform that okay. you can work with. So it's like a processor issuing platform. But that's not actually the issuing the cards is not the hard part. The hard part in building a credit card is actually managing the credit piece. So like having to build your own ledger, which just means like, you know, how do you keep track of all the transactions? How do you uh, create state statements for customers? How do you time when they have to pay you back? How do you 
compute how much each customer owes you, then monitoring the lines, making sure that your credit limit is appropriate to the size of the business. That's actually the hard part. So building all the technology to basically make sure that you don't lose money is the hard part, right? It's very easy. Anyone can just give money to someone, but getting it back is a difficult, is really the challenge. So yeah, building all the technology to do that has been so like, we have to learn how to underwrite these people. Yeah, we sense, have to right? learn how to underwrite it. So right now, actually, we have a chief risk officer who was in credit his entire career. He was at American Express. He worked there wow. on the corporate SMB side. He was at uh, another fintech before this. So everyone, for every major department we have, everyone leading it is like incredibly experienced. Like we just hired a general counsel who was at who, you know, Vivek, the presidential candidate. Yeah, presidential candidate. He was like the GC for v- Vivek's really? fund. Yeah. Jeez. So everyone everyone in the in Parker today who has a leadership role is like very legit. So our CFO is at another another fintech that does like, like he basically was there early. They do like hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. Shit. So yeah. So now the, the team that we have behind Parker is like, so how'd you attract this talent though? I'm curious. I was just going to ask that. Yeah, no, like, in that exact it's, wording. No, it's, 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 it's a perfect <laughs> question because he's like, I have killer, 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 killer. It's like, and it's like money's one thing, but like, how do you get them to be stoked about the vision? Right? Because yeah. there's so many options they can go to and they choose Parker, you know? I think one, it's the size of the opportunity. Okay. So it's like, we're going after something that we believe could be worth, you know, at least $10 billion one day. So we think the size of the opportunity is definitely there. I think another thing too is just like, obviously being very dedicated as founders, we've been working on this and we've been in this space for a long time and we have a very differentiated strategy. So it's very clear that we've like, what what we're doing is not easy. And it's very clear that we've differentiated from the pack and we found our way in the space. So I think there's that. And I think the other thing too is we were lucky to attract some pretty uh, good talent in the beginning. So for other like executives, when they see the quality of the team that's already there and the quality of the people they're going to get to work with, that's a huge uh, that's a huge benefit. And then quality of investors too, right? Like if you're backed by legitimate investors, that's that's always a good sign. Definitely, I think investors are the thing I want to go into as well with this one because like you've raised a whole bunch of money. Obviously, part of it has been debt because you like literally have to raise debt to do yeah. this, right? Like it's technically impossible to not do this without yeah, debt. Yeah, yeah, you can't do this with it. Without yeah, debt, yeah. Um, I don't even know. Like, should we go into that first? I'll, let's go into that first. Like, how the hell do you raise like two hundred fifty million dollars? That's gonna be a clip. That's gonna be an easy <laughs> clip. <laughs> how do you? You're twenty eight years old. How do you raise two hundred fifty million dollars? How do you raise a quarter billion? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. The, the question. short answer is you just ask for it, but the long, <laughs> <laughs> the long answer is it just takes a lot of years of building trust with people and trust with investors that you do right with their money. So I think it's like at every step of the way, we've shown that when we're given money, we execute with that capital and we're efficient in how we use it and we get results. So when we did when we first raised our angel round. We built our MVP. Then with that, you know, when we raised our seed round with Velar, we built out more of the product. We scaled more. When we raised our debt facilities, we did a good job at credit. You know, we didn't, you know, our credit losses are are really good for our industry. So just showing that you're very responsible and then making a name for yourself as a trust. It's it's really all based on trust mm-hmm. and relationships at the end of the day. The data basically signals trust is one of the ways I'd say it. Like if you have good data, it shows that you're competent and that creates trust. But at the end of the day, it's showing that you're able to handle those sums of money. And to be honest, a quarter billion sounds like a lot, but in our industry, it's not much, right? Like some of our competitors have literally raised a billion dollars worth of equity. So for us, we're just like, oh yeah, it might sound like a lot, but for me and my journey as a founder, I'm like, you know, 2% of the way there. And you mean like, Brex and Ramp and people like that in a sense because you kind of are competing in that space too. Yeah, yeah. I would say they're less present in our space as they used to be and we have something very different. But yeah, I'd say people like that. Can can we talk about what is different? I'm curious what is the big differentiator across the board? It's how the card works. Okay. And then it's the like the underwriting, of course, that stuff's very different, but it's also a lot of the software we're building around the card and around deposits and bill pay that's pretty specific to e-commerce. For sure. Yeah. Got you. 
because I, I feel like e-commerce needs it more than like the tech SaaS companies because like you are right cash conversions is the biggest most important thing yeah, in this space con- yeah exactly um, and like you guys extend it to like 45 days I think and you can go up to 90 up to 90 yeah we can go up to 90 wow so pretty much you could pay, you could buy something in January and not pay until what's that March yeah that's right so that makes a big difference you won't for a pay lot of the people. whole thing till March so the way it work it is that we'll split the repayment over three months okay um so yeah you can do that you can do it over 90 days so let's say you're like buying a bunch of shipping labels all at once yeah it's a pretty clunky expense and you want to just amortize it over a period of time that's a great product for that interesting yeah. you must have come across businesses that t- take advantage of that and then try not to pay you guys back I'm sure you've experienced that at one point or another. What, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you there's talk about that process? There's obviously bad actors in the space, but we're pretty well uh, legally protected. So if you try, so you to do not, what needs to be done. Yeah, you will have you'll 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 hear from our legal. You'll team. You'll be taken care yeah, of. Yeah, you'll be. That's, taken- that's got to be a pain in the ass, though. It is honest. I think something that disappointed me building this is seeing how like seeing like true like you really see human nature when you're running credit. You really see people's <laughs> true nature. It's like, yeah, some people like don't care about doing right by yeah. others at all. So that that's always been disappointing to see. For sure. I know Ron, uh, Ron Shaw, shout out Ron from Avi. He put out a tweet. I think it was yesterday. I just yeah, read one great. of those. Ron's helped us a ton. He's awesome. Yeah. So he put out a he put out a tweet that that I could definitely relate to when I was starting out in the e-commerce world and built my first couple of successful stores, which was that most brands overvalue credit card points and rewards. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll abuse it to the point where they don't even care if the business is operating profitably because they're like, oh, I get free travel, free this, free that, but at a compromise to their margins. And he's like, well, when you actually break break it down financially, the benefit that you'd get, like the return on your spend uh, for a 90 day or a, even a 60 day kind of cash payoff or cash conversion delay of being able to pay it off could be you know 10 to 1 20 to 1 whereas you get three four percent back on yeah, the reward. Exactly. So, so there were times where i was using you know the amex gold and i had a business doing 10 grand a day that was making like 500 profit and i was like i was okay with that and i wasn't really optimizing for margins because i knew that like oh the credit card rewards are coming in so i have a million two million points whatever but it, <laughs> and it's but it's a psychological thing that a lot yeah. of business owners go through that like screw that you know focus on profitability right I think the reason the points work is because what most e-com founders are after is a lifestyle, right? And the points are kind of a hack to get access. It's a shortcut to that lifestyle, right? So when I talk to a lot of founders, they don't want to miss out on their first class flights. But what we try to explain is basically (laughs) like, that's really what it is, right? So sneak peek, like we're going to have a rewards card next year. We're still going to explain to you guys why float is, but we're going to have a rewards card because people want it, we'll, we'll build it. Yeah. But it's really just that. It's the access to the lifestyle. And that's worth a lot to a lot of e-com business owners. Um, but really, the what we explain is like, listen, like if you get more float, right? If you get more float by using our rolling terms, you're going to have more cash in your bank account. Instead of using a loan to buy your inventory, use that extra cash that you have from using our card. Now you're financing your inventory for much cheaper use the excess profits to buy your flight, right? Yeah, like, interesting. The, yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. like the amount of sales. I mean, we've had brands go from like one to two million a month to six million a month because they just optimize their cash conversion cycle with our card, Yeah, right? Like they can start, they, you, you, basically what happens is you can afford like a lower ROAS because you're, you know. Because you just have, you have more yeah, time. Yeah, cash, yeah, yeah. You have more time, exactly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can kind of like, expand to acquiring more customers afford like a slightly lower ROAS so it's yeah it's just much smarter I have, I have a question I was thinking about this on the car on the way here so if you're pushing 45 days right do you charge for 45 days 45 days is free so how do you so how do you guys do that though we make money on the uh, on transaction fees so I, I got yeah. that like like interchange plus whatever yeah, the hell yeah, it yeah. is but I'm saying like aren't all credit cards like 30 days credit cards are actually 15 days 15 yeah because so 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 this is the thing. Credit cards are advertised as 30-day products, but you only get 30 days on the first day of the month. I see what you're saying. The last day of the month is due technically the next first day of the next month, right? I see. So on that last day, 
you're actually just getting one day to pay it back. And so on average, you're getting 15 days. Oh, I see. All right. So we're giving you 3x the duration of a traditional charge card. Got you. Yeah. But like, like how do you... Well, I thought I, I, f- I found my own answer. The money's yours. You guys are loaning out that money. So you don't really care if you get it 15 days later than like the average credit card. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. you're giving that kind of benefit to the brands in a sense. Exactly. Got it. And like you see a whole bunch of brands, obviously. I'm curious what brands kind of, uh, not to say names or anything, but like what do some brands do that like when they use your card, they're just like, boom, like it's like game changer. I'm very curious what that looks like in a sense. I think it's, I think most I mean, this is true of most brands. Anyone who's spending a lot on ads, mm-hmm. hits, it's just a game changer because now instead of paying off the entire ad balance in a single payment, you're on a daily repayment cycle. So whatever you were spending on ads on a 45-day basis is now excess cash in your bank account. And so what we see happen is like now because of the negative cash conversion cycle, let's say you're like your payback period is 30 days, right? So you're you're selling a supplement subscription. Day zero, you don't make money. You're at break even. Day 30, you're making money. So you're at a profit. Basically, with our net 45-day card, you're going to be on a, a cash convers- conversion cycle of negative 15 days. So then your cash balance is just going to start building up, building oh, up, I building see. up. You can afford to you know, lower your ROAS a little bit. You can buy more inventory, keep reinvesting. Like We've seen the craziest growth stories with our card like people literally going from one two million a month to six seven million dollars a month right and because of our underwriting algorithm as you scale we can keep growing your limit so yeah it's 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 really a game changer for brands it's almost like you get the benefits of like raising a little bit of money without having to raise money yeah exactly exactly damn and like you're just bar you're borrowing your honesty for free though too that's the part that's craziest to me yeah, it's like a free line of credit and it's the interest is subsidized by the interchange. By the interchange, yeah. yeah. And like like all crackers are making money on interchange anyways. Yeah. So it's we like, do, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Some of our products do have an additional fee, but you're yeah. also getting more time. And if you actually compare it to a line of credit, it's actually much cheaper because it's like 1% for 60 days, which is a, like 6% APR, mm-hmm. a and, little and more than is, one. Is this credit card like kind of the... Uh, like the first step into this whole just banking world in a sense. Yeah, I'm exactly. So, right? so the card is really the wedge. So we started the card because it solves a very clear pain point around like how do you how do you basically optimize your spend, you know, for like mm-hmm. ad spend, shipping spend, all that kind of stuff. But now we have, you know, we have customers who are on checking accounts, we have bill pay. Around bill pay, we want to help you track your cost of goods sold. So let's say you upload an invoice to Parker, we can pull out the line item of what you're buying and actually like link it to the different SKUs that you're selling on your store so you can keep track of your COGS. And what what we want to get to is we want to get to the point where you're logging into Parker and you can see your profitability in real time, SKU level profitability, profitability of all your ad campaigns. Because we own all your financial data, we can do that. Um, and yeah, that's that's really where we're heading now. What, what, what's that profit app you use? It's like, like very- Profit Calc? Profit cock. Oh, there's, oh, there's, there's, triple whale also has like triple a whale. In one. There was one that there's used to have all the time. Metrics. I remember. Yeah. yeah like, the issue with those is they they don't take in the financial data. No, I was gonna say like yeah. there's a whole other step of like yeah, the real exactly. numbers. Like yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. about you guys, but I I remember. I think I think this was in twenty. I think this was in twenty twenty. I remember we were we were building this. I was like the, we were saying this like bark controller, like literally a controller, like get. Your okay. dog to like stop barking. <laughs> collar, right? Or yeah. Like, no, it wasn't a collar. It was literally just like it would make a noise. Like a noise? Yeah, okay. yeah. And <laughs> we were like, we were just looking at sales minus ad spend. And we were just like, wow, we're profitable. Let's scale this thing <laughs> up. And we weren't accounting for like all these different like shipping costs, customer processing success fees, costs, processing fees. Refunds. And so we scaled that thing like super quickly. And then I remember, I remember doing the math and I was like, like, I was like, wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me, let me run the PL myself. And then I realized, like, we thought we were going to make like 20k profit that week, and we had instead lost fifty thousand dollars because we oh, weren't properly shit. accounting, yeah, for all our costs. And when I saw that, I was like, man, like, I just need to build Parker. Because <laughs> <laughs> I needed myself. Yeah, I was like, I yeah. needed myself. Like, I just need to. You need to be super on top of profitability, right? And profitability is not sales minus ad spend. No, no, sales no. minus ad spend minus your processing fees minus. Projected SAS sales minus tax. your VAs minus the taxes. Like Literally. you have to take into account everything. People always forget the taxes too. Yeah. Oh yeah. The taxes, it's actually, 
the taxes is literally like the highest expense of the whole year. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. nobody even like cost. thinks about it. It's kind of crazy. It's, it's like, like more than 30, 40 percent <laughs> every year. Yeah, biggest yeah. cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And so you say you would do this, it started like five years ago, but really the inflection part was two years ago, right? Yeah, I would say I would say early twenty, like three three years ago is when yeah. Three, so so what what happened in this? That's what I'm curious of. I think my co-founder and I we just got like super tired of things not working out, and we were just we got extremely dedicated. We had that problem ourselves, and we were like, okay, like we're just gonna make this work. Like we're gonna push the world into seeing. Making this thing work. Yeah. And it was this product, like just literally e-commerce credit card. Like that was it. So we we always wanted to, the vision from the get-go. I'm pretty sure I'm the first one to come up with this. Like I've seen other people try to build it. I won't name them. I'm pretty sure I'm the first one to come up with this <laughs> because I wrote a YC application. Like in five, six years ago. In 2018 with this concept of basically becoming like the financial back end operating system, whatever you want to call it for e-commerce. So you saw Brex or something like that. And you were like, well, at the time Brex was a card for startups. It was a card for tech companies. And I, I saw what they were doing. I was like, oh, wow. Like, you know, I'm running e-coms. I think there's something there for e-coms. And I just really saw how the e-com use case was specific enough and niche enough that it warranted its own solution. For sure. Um, it's it's crazy that you say that. So like I went to Cal for my undergraduate, UC Berkeley. Yeah. And Enrique spoke in my class sophomore year oh, really? about Brex. And I was like, who's this like little kid that like from Brazil? Like it wasn't like a big thing back then. I had no clue what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Do you like, remember what year that was? Twenty eighteen. Okay, that was yeah. very that yeah. yeah that was early for them. Too. And and like they had billboards at in, in Berkeley. It said like Brex, like not billboards. They were like um bus stop boards, yeah. like those things. And like I was like, oh, this is cool, like whatever Bay Area like startup. And then like literally, I think like twenty nineteen, it just went crazy, crazy in a sense. Yeah. They just like you would just see they they had that one article they were pumping ads to. And it was like young founders raised like, I don't know, a billion dollars, like a hundred million dollars, blah, blah, blah. And they just kept pumping that thing. And then, then I saw all these credit cards start popping up. You saw like Brex, Ramp. Ramp yeah. And then I think a year passed and then all the e-commerce versions of these things kind of started happening yeah, in a yeah, sense. Yeah. I um, remember Ramp was, I remember being in YC and Ramp was, um, Ramp was like just getting started. They had this weird logo Everyone was confused because everyone was like, wait, this is just Brex, but with cash back. Like, how is this any <laughs> different? And it's 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 crazy because it's just in a few years, they they really caught up For to sure. what Brex was building. Yeah. Um, but yeah, honestly, both uh, great companies. Obviously, I think that we're going to own e-commerce. It's just a matter of time for it to happen. We have the best team behind it. I think my, you know, something that makes a big difference is Milan, my co-founder, and I actually built e-coms before, so we mm-hmm. have good product intuition on one needs to be there. I don't really see that with much of the other founders in the space. So, what's what's like the split between who does what between you and Milan? Yeah, when we started out, we were doing everything together, which is okay. a horrible idea. Who's coding? That's what I'm curious of. We have there's an we have a CTO and an engineering team. Oh wow! Okay. In the early days, it was the two of us. We were first putting the product together ourselves for sure but obviously as we scaled up it's like you need real team yeah yeah we're just like okay like there's better people like you know better engineers than us out there let's bring them on and help us build this definitely and how was that experience going through yc in like 2018 i think yc opens a lot of doors Mm -hmm. i think if you want to get in the tech industry and you just um you know you don't know anybody or maybe if you do know people but like especially for me right i was a complete outsider i was like in my early 20s, dropping out, studying physics and computer science, thought I'd be working on research, like be, you know, working on quantum computers or something, but instead was making money in e-com. So for me, YC was a game changer because it just gave me access to like the, basically the best network in Silicon Valley. Um, So you dropped out of college? I dropped out in my last year. He he did too. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Who wins? For yeah. e-commerce. Literally for yeah. e-commerce. Yeah. yeah, I dropped. I was in my last year. I think I did. I was always a good student, though. I was a pretty good student, but I got pretty bored with it by my last year. I I kind of, yeah, I was always a bit anti-school. Um, and you started ripping on Shopify. Yes. Yeah. Maybe not Maybe not enough to justify leaving, but yeah. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, now when you look back, you're like, shit, that wasn't enough money, but like, yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, yeah. For sure. It worked out fine for me, so it's 
another thing too i think like this is the first time we're meeting obviously i feel like you have like an uh an aura presence to yourself in a sense really it's like weird to like obviously like say that to somebody but i just feel like there is where like uh how can i put this like uh you're like a lot more mature than like for your age like you're older than me you're 28 but like yeah you give like a 40 50 year old vibe in a sense of like very <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. just like meticulous and like you think through stuff and like you've experienced a lot in a sense and i'm curious like where does that come from like like it seems like you like think through a lot of decision making rather than just like doing stuff quickly just like instinctually um i think some of it has come from i've been like this since i was young so i think there's that too where it just have a lot of foresight uh but i think a lot of it just comes from the people we work with day in day out so we made a point very early on milan and i that like if you hear jeff Bezos speak or you hear any of the best entrepreneurs of all time speak, one thing they always emphasize is hiring people who are a lot better than you are mm -hmm. at different things and like not not shying away from that. And you want to even get to the point where you walk into the office and you think to yourself, wow, I wouldn't get a job here today. I think that's true <laughs> of Parker today. Like I don't think I don't think I'd be hired that's at a cool Parker way of today. Yeah. And so I think we made a point of just hiring people who were a lot more experienced than we were and a lot more um, really just like talented at what they were doing. So I think if you just spend your time with people like that day in, day out, who are just older and more mature, it's kind of a forcing function on you, right? You can't really show up and act like a, like a kid. <laughs> like yeah. a kid, yeah. yeah. So you just have to mature a lot. Also, just the level of responsibility from running the company and makes it that way. How too. many employees do you guys have? We're around 40 now, but okay. yeah, we big plans to expand in the next year. So I think 20, 2024 is just going to be a big game changer for our company. For sure. So we're going to go from, I think, just being this company that has like product market fit or product people love to actually being, I think, like a pretty major start. My next question is, how are you preparing for that? Because I feel like Michael from like 40, like say 200 employees, right? Or even more than that. Like, how do you even prepare for that right now as a founder? I think... I don't know. I think it's about having the right execs who've done it before. And that kind of insulates you because realistically, I haven't had the experience of scaling a company to that many people before. But the reason I have confidence that it could happen and could happen in a way that's responsible and makes sense financially is that the executives we have have done it before. So I can trust them to do it. Like I'm not, I'm not managing, you know, people on the engineering team day in, day out. That's you know, our CTO does that. Same with our CFO, you know, he manages the finance team or chief risk, head of risk. You know, he manages the risk team or general counsel takes care of legal. You know, now we have to bring in leadership and, and growth. But, you know, that I'm just, I'm basically there to make sure that we have money in the bank account, we're fundraising, you know, making sure the executives are on track and that we're executing against the vision. So even though the team is scaling up, that responsibility goes more so to the executives who have the experience doing that. Like you wouldn't want me to manage like 300 people right now. That's not. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. That's how, yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. not my skill set. For sure. So, so what are you doing day to day as like one of the co-founders of this company? I'm curious. Yeah, my job today is basically making sure that we grow, so spending time with the growth team, fundraising, talking to investors. And uh, I'm in a lot of product conversations as well. Okay, I got um, you. But like I'm saying this, but if you're listening to this and you're early stage and you're doing what I'm doing now, like you're you're not doing the right thing. Talking to customers is another big one. You all you always need to be talking to customers. For sure. Yeah. But I feel like early on that's like stupid important, right? Yeah, yeah. Early on that's the only thing you should be doing. The yeah. only thing you should be doing early on is like talking to customers and building your product. That's such a YC thing to say yeah. too. It's kind of funny. That's the other way to say it is like you gotta sell. Oh right? yeah, yeah. You gotta yeah, sell yeah, to yeah. users deliver them the product i mean it's the same thing it doesn't matter if you're if you're building an agency like you got to be I, you do sell you're right? either selling or you're delivering the service so it's the same concept right if you're an e-com you're either i mean e-com is basically all marketing so you're yeah. not even building the product <laughs> yeah so you're running facebook ads you're running yeah. facebook ads <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's i was gonna the question i was asked was like what do you see big e-commerce brands doing to be successful right now but the answer is just run for more facebook ads <laughs> I think I think the pattern that I see. So I I don't really care about top line in ecom. Like if you're running an ecom, you're I just 
I honestly don't even believe in a venture-backed model for e-com because I've just seen so many businesses do well being bootstrapped that I don't see the point. You know, I think there's a certain scale you can get to where maybe like preferred equity would make sense, but you know, I think you should just bootstrap. What I see that works that's very profitable is selling some kind of subscription-based product and your landing page is a sing you have a single offer. You're not selling like 100 SKUs or 50 SKUs, single SKU offer, right? And then you run basically Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is with UGC. So like strong, like, you know, you could have like an organic content strategy on TikTok and IG and then run ads to basically use like UGC as your content, run ads to that single offer, use like direct response copy and find a product that has like, it's, there's like a, like a, a strong narrative or like theme around what you're doing, right? So like now carnivore is hot, you know, microplastics, microplastics, not, yeah, microplastics yeah, yeah. right? Like these kinds of like viral ideas that people are picking up on. If you can get a product. Like cold tubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that, right? You, like just did you hear Plunge did like a hundred million dollars this year or something like that? Really? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, that's yeah. Nuts. It's yeah. kind of crazy though, because I did the math and that's they're only selling two thousand of those a month. Which mm. like is crazy, but it's also not that crazy. You know what I mean? Like there's so many e com brands that do two thousand dollars a month. It's not a lot. Yeah, yeah their AOV's yeah. only but it's 50. A six thousand dollar product. It's expensive, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like probably really good margins too. Literally. Yeah. I heard that on my first million that they went from like zero to a hundred million in like two and a half years. It's crazy. Yeah. And like their CPA was like three hundred and thirty dollars. No way. Yeah. Huh. Insane. Yeah. It's so like they're they're running like a like a ten row as some shit like that. Twelve yeah, or something. Maybe like that. high ticket e com is underestimated. <laughs> yeah. You gotta have one you gotta have one or the other. You have to have either have like good margin through higher price point or stickiness. Or and stickiness. Continuity. Yeah, exactly. It's like maybe you yeah. don't make money on first sale, kind of break even, but then you've got strong email campaigns on the back end and you're you know, you're monetizing you, You've run some high ticket stuff, haven't you? Like in the past? Uh, I mean top maybe like 200 to 300 dollars uh nothing crazy but yeah six thousand is is that's very up there. yeah it's interesting that's definitely up there like you have money to you pretty much you have like a lot of ad spend you could put behind it to like make a sale uh, actually i've you sold know? i've i sold these luxury bed sheets at huh. like 600 700 those did really well really and our costs on those were like 100 bucks so that, really? that was actually a really good markup okay that's that's pretty profitable and, and those those it was like really easy to make was uh, there a gross margin on that 80 80 percent okay plus wow that's yeah. profitable offer yeah yeah and, and yeah. it like it did well but we ended up coming into a qual a product quality issue where it's like you know we ordered we ordered samples after we had sold probably quarter million of them in like two months <laughs> as <laughs> as most like new you know new founders drop shipping especially do and then like we got them you're like mm, do we really want to push this to 500k a month or should we like <laughs> cut back and try to improve quality and i had no experience with like product design yeah, or manufacturing yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and so I, you know, I tried to like get more samples and it just like didn't really end up working out. So it fizzled out, but yeah, good experience. But that was a pretty high price product. And it was yeah. it's surprisingly easier to sell than some of the lower priced products that I've sold in the past. Weird. Really? But yeah. You, like you go off to a market so where like, weird. if they want it. Yeah, it, no, it is. Pricing is tough. The, and the going after the right customer is probably one of the most important things. So like if you go after a customer that really wants that product and it just makes sense, then it's such an easier sell than going after a customer that doesn't want it and trying to over market to them, you know? Yeah, I know. That's for sure. Yeah, pricing yeah. is so interesting because you would think lower pricing, more sales, but it just never It never that liked way. that. Yeah. It's yeah, never yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm curious for you too. So you want to make like a $10 billion, billion dollar business in a sense. Like that's the vision. Yeah. How do you get like what's like your mindset to even get there or do you even think about how do i get there like have you like literally sat down and been like this is gonna happen this is gonna happen this is gonna happen or you kind of just no, play it day by day it's, it's very it's like more like guerrilla warfare okay where you have this the way I, the way i've experienced it i i don't know about other founders but the way i've experienced it is i have it's more like an an intuition plus data that there is this product vision and this is, this is, it's like, think of it like a, like a mental image that I have of like, you know, once the product is like this and we have these different offers and things are like that, this is like a $10 billion opportunity. But then realistically, because this is a more complex product we're building, we have to be very tactical on how we get there. 
And so that's why I say it's like guerrilla warfare because every it's like you you're here, you want to get there, and then you have to trace zigzag your path, all zigzag the way your path, right? So like the one of the reasons we start started with the card is at the time fintech was hot. So we were like, oh, if we grow the card, it's a pure fintech product that's going to help us fundraise. And it was a hack to grow very quickly because we we were growing with middle market customers. Acquire one of these businesses, they spent hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a month. So the, the the revenue we were generating off of them was much higher than what we can generate from like a thousand small e-coms just getting started. But then now the market shifted, where people are more conservative, so they want to see that you can generate SaaS revenue. FinTech's not as hot, so now we have to invest more in that, right? So you have to be very tactical in how you execute against the product vision. And it just changes because there's a, there's a lot of variables at play. There's, you know, obviously most important is consumer demand. What do, what do people actually want to use? For what sure. pain points do they have in the market? Are these pain points addressed by other players? How well are they addressed? Can you have something that's differentiated, right? Then it's like, start with that. Then there's also your other customers, like the vent, the venture capitalists, right? If you're building a technology company to be worth $10 billion, if you're building like a digital banking product like we are, you can't do it without capital. It takes money to build it. So then you want to make sure that you're building it in a way that investors see value in that business. They see a lot of enterprise value in that business. So that those are that's what you're constantly navigating. And these things are always in flux. <laughs> You you say these words and I feel like young founders, like even first time founders who are older, don't even understand that. So like you're like literally saying like I need to do this to build enterprise value, like just that word in a sense. People don't even think about that, right? Everyone's just like, well, I got to raise money to build this product and like sell it. It's like no, like I literally have to. What's what's the word? You, you even said it before. You're like the market wanted fintech products in the beginning. Now market wants more like SaaS revenue now. So yeah. we're going to like, we still have this big vision picture, but we're just going to pivot a little bit to kind of start building that piece out of it while holding the other piece as well. Exactly. Right? exactly. So you can go raise more money to get to your real goal in a sense of like a full blown platform for banking. Exactly. So at every step of the way, it's, it's kind of like the market wants to see, are you able to execute on X, Y, and Z? And then your team is evaluated on its, because basically what's being underwritten we're still early stage, right? Yeah, you like, are, yeah. So what's being underwritten, even at our stage, is just quality of the team. Is the team able to execute on what they say they're going to execute on? So when you were asking about how do you raise a lot of capital, well, one of the ways is when I meet with investors and I say, we're going to do X, and I see them three months from the, from now, it's like X is done, right? And a lot of founders... They don't. love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All law firms don't do that. Don't yeah. do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either they set X as being too crazy or, you know, usually it's that and they just like don't get it done. So I think that's something that's helped us build credibility. G give me an example of when you did that for an investor and like it worked perfectly for you. Like I'm curious. Yeah, act actually we did that really well this year where I went to meet with, uh, you know, a number of VCs and I was like, hey, like, you know, we're going to get the, we're going to be fully integrated with our own banking partner. We're going to have new term sheets to refinance our debt. So we're going to lower our costs significantly. And we're going to have new products launched by the end of the year. And they're kind of like, oh, okay, you know. Sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Okay, yeah, we hear that all the time. Then four months down the line, sorry. You're good, you're good. Four months down the line, went to see them again. I was like, hey, here's the update. We grew 50, 60. Uh, that's my friend, Tim. You guys should actually. Oh, yeah? You guys should uh, interview him at Get some him point. Yeah. Lives in New York? Miami. Okay, we'll go back. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's, uh, yeah, so anyways, it's like everything we said we were going to do, we did. And that was impressive to a lot of the investors. And even the ones we talk to now, if they say no, I'm like, and they're like, oh, come back to us when you have this. Maybe they're bullshitting me. They're just trying to say no. But I'm like, okay, I will come I back. I will come back. <laughs> and you, these things will have gotten done, just, just so you know. But also for us, from a fundraising standpoint, that's why I take my time because I just know our team is so good at executing. Every month that goes by, more revenue, more product, more traction. So I'm like, okay, if you guys want to underwrite us on a revenue multiple, I'm just going to wait because every... <laughs> <laughs> it just Cause, keeps going up. Because it just keeps yeah. going up, right? So I'm like, okay, you can get in now or you can wait six months and you know we'll have double, tri like, yeah, doubled by then, and then you'll have to, you know, pay double the price. <laughs> pay more. That's yeah. kind of funny. S stupid question on the product side. Why would a brand go with Parker over like a zero percent APR card for fifteen months, for example? 
a zero percent APR card for fifteen months. They, yeah. No, they, no, fifteen. They have those. Like you go to Bank of America, they'll give you like, like twelve the, to fifteen months. Like, like a business like card. a no APR new credit card for like twelve. If the brand months only needs like hundred like k a month, and it, or or I guess I guess it would cap out at if you had a hundred k limited, cap out at a hundred k. But that's probably it. I mean, you're you're paying the interest after the fifteen month period, right? So it's mm -hmm. like a limit. But you could just get another offer. fifteen month card. <laughs> there was a time when we got into e-commerce uh, we were like how old 20 19 whatever the hell we were 18 19 kyle had a whole booklet in his room of credit of cards. credit cards like this big like this many cards really any card you could think of this man i had did it. up until like a year and then i like and then he realized i cut a ton of them stupid. that i wasn't <laughs> using and that it had annual fees and whatever but but there were ones that were helpful uh with cash flow that were like 12 months and I would use, like I wouldn't pay back for like three months. Um, Cause I'm, I'm a bit like, e even the the 12 month APR cards that I have now, like I pay off every month. Like I don't, I don't like yeah, the head space yeah, yeah. that it takes up, you know, but, but it, I mean, it is a valid thing that like someone might ask you, I'm curious as to like what, what your answer to that would be. I think, I think, you know, I'm sure some, I think something I realize is like customers want stability. So you can hack it and you can try to get people on these like, you know, we'll give you 3% cash back for three months kind of thing. Usually as a business, when you offer these these sorts of things, people will use you for the three months and then churn. Yeah. So it's not even worthwhile. So I think in that example, like, yeah, I'm sure some people would use it, but Parker's giving you 45 days for free forever, right? So as long as and it's not just the card it's like the financial analytics on the yeah the you're almost like a fractional the bill, cfo the like, bill pay like all these things that we're gonna have released so that's man, right so but honestly zero percent like fuck like why not have it on your stack you know like it's, it's yeah, a good tool yeah. to have that's too. gonna be a good that's gonna be a good clip you're, when you see was like parker forever is gonna give 45 days for free that's gonna be a good clip that we're gonna clip yeah, that yeah, yeah, given, <laughs> if interest rates stay so well, right right well that was my next question it's like interest rates uh, we're at like four percent now. We're at like yeah. well, five year now is like I think what four or something like that. Three nine, uh, um, five the like the five like the five like the like the ten year or something yeah. like that. It's like yeah, 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 yeah. So like it keeps moving in a sense, right? Yeah. How does this affect the debt that you've raised? Is this like variable it debt? Is it, it more, fixed? Right? It makes it more expensive. No, I, I know that, yeah. but like the debt when you raise it, is this a variable debt? Is it fixed? It's debt? It's always variable. It's always variable. It's always mm. variable. Yeah. Real, so then you're. APR that you have to charge people has to go up, obviously. Yeah. Well, the way you manage it is you tighten the underwriting. Okay. So when the rates go up, you basically you provision for less losses. So you make the you make it more stringent for companies what, to apply. What, what is lo when you say losses, what does that mean? Yeah, like basically your two biggest costs in our business are like interest to our capital partners and frauds and losses. So like, like people not paying back stuff like, like that. basically like people not paying back so you're always you're adjusting for that got you so like when the rates do go up your cost of capital goes up our cost of capital goes up does it go down too when it goes down yeah okay that's why we have we're launching checking accounts okay when mm -hmm. you make money off the float off checking accounts that kind of hedges against rates got you and i'm curious because these banking products are like they're not simple to understand they're pretty fucking complicated yeah yeah like uh are you not scared making like setting these shits up like, this thing up in a sense like i'd be so scared making like my own checking accounts for people you know what i mean yeah like yeah, fdic yeah. insurance and all this other type of <laughs> yeah, crap it's like definitely stressful to build because you're dealing with people's money and so yeah. your systems have to be very sound and but you guys have all that stuff like yeah, all the yeah, fdic yeah. insurance like all this yeah, other yeah. Stuff. i think i think we off offer up to five it's either five or ten million wow. oh wow yeah the way we do it is we basically when you when you have uh, a checking account with us we like disperse it across different banks i see so you get advanced mm. so basically for you as a customer it's like a very you know you're just using it feels like you're just using one bank one. account but your your money's diversified so a lot of people That's sometimes cool. are like hey we're holding our money with chase like chase is safer i'll say all right like you want to trust the brand, have some money there, but our FDIC insurance is more than what you can get with one checking account on Chase. So pretty much, you're pretty much taking like 10 accounts at 250 a piece and spread them across Yeah, the something right, like right. that. Yeah. Because 250 standard. 250 standard. Yeah, 250 standard. Interesting. It's cool because it's like FinTech, you can do a whole bunch of crazy stuff. That exactly, like yeah. Chase can't do. Exactly. And like exactly. you kind of take advantage, just kind of gain like a, an edge on these on these brands. Exactly, yeah.
Yeah. You, what else you got? Um, we recently had a guest, Mo Hayek, and he was he had a controversial take on drop shipping. So he got he got into the drop shipping world, made some money there, and then he quickly pivoted to like to to building you know real brands or real brands right with inventory yeah. stuff like that. And so going back and being like, oh, that was that was stupid. I wouldn't advise people to do it now. Um, and I'm just curious, like your overall take on drop shipping versus like D to C and if you have any opinions on either of the two, or if you would advise people to start, because a, a lot of people, I think they want to rush into the brand building. And I personally am a huge advocate of drop shipping for a period of time. If you want to get into e-commerce and you don't have the cash, because you learn all of the skills that you would building a big brand without the risk of ordering a product that's shit and that your customers hate. And then you lost all this money. Uh, getting inventory. So, I, what's your take on just the whole the business model as a whole? Yeah, drop shipping. The way I view it, it's just a it's just a, a method of fulfillment, That's and fair. it's actually a very efficient method of fulfillment. The issue with it is usually if you're fulfilling order by order, you can't get your cogs down to the level that you need them to be to actually generate enough profit. But you can you can be profitable at drop shipping. So you know what the usual story is, right? You start with, I, I think it's a matter of expectations. Like if you're thinking that you're going to make $20 million net drop shipping, that's likely not realistic. But I agree with you. I think it's one of the, I learned e-com and I l actually learned, for me, the best business school was actually drop shipping because you're, you're basically, you don't have to worry about product. So all you're thinking about is like marketing, customer success, and then basically accounting, right? Or like, those are like the three things you're focused on. So I actually think drop shipping is a great way to learn. It's also a great way to make your first like 5, 10, 20, 30K. If you're in high school, you're young and you just want to learn, it's, it's, it's fine. It's a great way to make money. Yeah, yeah it's a great way on. to make money. But are you, you know, are you going to build this like sus very sustainable source of cash flow with drop shipping? Unlikely. 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 I mean, I've heard some stories, but you know, from my experience, I never made like a million dollars drop shipping, you know, make like, you know, 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 K. Those are amounts you can make, but it's a good, it's a good starting point. Because when you're starting a brand, you have to buy inventory at first. That's very expensive. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you don't know what you're doing on the marketing side, it's probably not a good idea to do it. So I think drop shipping is a good Yeah, start. A lot of very successful brand owners, they start drop shipping and then they, like they learn all those skill sets they don't learn you know product manufacturing r d customizations yeah, yeah. and so it's like but th those things you can learn or you can hire someone to learn if you have the capital from the drop shipping exactly. so you hire someone to make a great product exactly. to make sure the manufacturing is good to and you learn the inventory and you already know all those other things so it makes for a good good recipe it's a good school like my yeah. you know my cousin is what is he now he's like 20 21 and he makes it makes like 50 to 100k a month profit drop shipping wow. but he's obviously stuck he's stuck in the same problem everyone has doing it right when you're drop shipping someone figures out your offer figures out it's profitable it gets competitive cat goes up you're not making money then you have to find a new offer new products you're always in that rat race and eventually race, yeah. eventually you're like okay like i need to build something more sustainable here cuz i'm sick yeah. and tired of starting from scratch but you do learn a lot of skills though like media buying yeah. skills like finance for cheap skills, too for pretty for literally for free for free, 30 yeah. bucks a month on shopify it's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah yeah it's yeah it's you're learning crazy. a lot of skills right you're learning yeah. how to use shopify you're learning about customer support you're learning like how to you know influencer management you learn a lot mm -hmm. drop shipping so i do agree with that actually brought up customer support how does uh, Parker deal with customer support? Because I feel like credit card and banks have the worst customer support Terrible. in the whole world. So how do you guys kind of solve that problem? <laughs> that's just hired for it full time. Yeah. I think it's also a matter of like people, people have very similar requests. It's either they want to make a transaction, transaction doesn't go through, making sure you have engineers on support to like look into those issues at all times, common issues. Can we get a credit limit increase? So having people on the credit team, like working on that, monitoring the systems, making sure we're on top of it so we can even preempt uh, credit limit increases. So those are the common things people ask for. Do you guys work with international clients like outside the US? If you have a US corporation, we can work with you. So you can be based in Europe, but you have a US LLC and you're receiving payments in the United States, we can work with you. We do have global plans though. Do you help people set, like, do you have a, like a partner service that you could recommend pe to people to incorporate in the U.S.? We don't now. Yeah, you're Canadian, yeah. man. You got to do some stuff in Canada. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's the thing. I think I'm definitely looking at Canada. 
Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And you're not you're not looking into anything like payment processing related. Um, I think there's probably some interesting partnerships we can do with payment processors, but no, it's too. We want to stay focused on like the actual products you're using day to day. I think I think if you go on the checkout side and payment processing side, we really want to be more friendly with the pr- platforms. And if you go there, you become like competitive to one of their core businesses. So that's not really something we want to get into. Interesting. Yeah. It's a whole different beast. Yeah. yeah. Because Shopify is making all the money on processing. Yeah. yeah, pro- yeah. Checkout's an important part of their business. So for them, it's hosting and checkout are super important. So if you're like, if you're messing with that, you end up in a competitive position to them. And you don't so. want to be doing that. No, not from where we are today. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. It is a big problem in the industry for for a lot of brands. The just processing in general, like the like, cost of it. Uh, well, n- not so much the cost, but like brands that are legitimate business that have inventory that have a 05 percent chargeback rate that get a thirty percent rolling reserve, which you guys yeah. would help tremendously with yeah, from yeah, a, yeah, the with card the perspective. But like, it's kind of crazy that they consider zero point five percent chargebacks like high risk. If you look at like a Target, a Walmart, a, a normal grocery store, they probably have more than 0.5% like issue rate. But, but I guess that's more voluntary like refunds. So it's different. Yeah. I'd have to look more into the issue. I think people will go to like these um, private, yeah, they local. Do. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of high yeah, risk contacts. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah. yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I feel like just like the, the financial world is such a big world, but it's like kind of like black box. I yeah. feel like a lot of these like newer fintechs are making that black box less dark in a sense. Really, just like you can, you can do more with it in a sense. You know what I mean? And you guys are doing a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah like helping sure. a lot of e-commerce brands grow with it. So it's all good stuff. I have a, a personal question: Are you happy? Am I happy? It's a tough one. <laughs> I, I'd say I'm pretty. I'm pretty grateful for where I am in life. I'd say I'm. I'm definitely grateful. I'm decently happy, decently happy. So he doesn't but I don't, happy. <laughs> I don't, I don't optimize, I don't optimize my life for happiness. Like I'm very well aware that um, a lot of life is suffering no matter, no matter what you do. So I think that's not, I, I don't really optimize for, for uh, happiness, but I'm definitely very grateful for the opportunity that I have. That's for sure. So I think like, you can live your life in a in a place where you're always in competition and you're always looking at others and you feel resentment and jealousy for not having more or you look at it like wow like this is awesome i get to work on this i get to grow i get to learn from other people so i think i i'm definitely i'm definitely like that maybe that's a bit of a political answer but no, like more I'm, like more like I'm growth not, minded yeah, yeah, yeah i think a lot of people see happiness as like an end goal but it's 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 not yeah no it's it's not for me yeah I feel like every day the grind should kind of make you happy in a sense. Kind of. I yeah. mean, it's more like fo- feeling fulfilled. fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. It's like yesterday I signed a really big lease for a new warehouse. Like, yeah. Very, very big. Um, and like probably for like 45 minutes, my whole body just hurt after that. It's really <laughs> a fat check. <laughs> Our own money, obviously. And I'm like, yeah. shit. But then. The next day you wake up, you're like, oh shit, no, this is like good because it's like, it's good to kind of feel like that. Yeah. Like, you know, you're growing you're like growing, that. Yeah. And you're like forcing yourself to just level up in a sense. Um, so I kind of agree with you in a sense where it's like, that does make you happy. You just, it doesn't feel like, oh, like in the movies, all smiles and happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. As long as you're growing. Exactly. It's yeah, the growth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think when I look at my journey and just seeing how much I've grown and the level of opportunity I've had, it's like, I'm, I'm definitely very grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very aware of what, you know, where I can improve and where things can get better. So that's like, that's like the fun of it, right? You're never really done. Yeah, definitely. I had one last question and we, we can wrap it up. I feel like once you get to a point where you're, you're at a growth level that most business owners can only dream of, it's getting to the next level is more about saying no like you, you, you have to say no to a lot of opportunities that other people would never have the chance to have fall on their lap, as opposed to like thinking of the next best idea or figuring, you know, trying to solve some pro- arbitrary problem. Um, are there what now that you've built this? Are there a lot of opportunities that like fall on your lap that you just got to say no to all day long, or or communication channels that you had to cut off and be a lot more mindful of how you allocate your time? I think, I think the more you grow. 
the more attacks that you get as well. So having to fend them off and having strategies for that is definitely important because people see that you have success and they want to, you know, competitors want a piece of it. Um, I think that you have to say no more. Like, I like, think like, we part- were, like we were just talking, it's like payment, payment process, that's an opportunity. And you're just like, you're like, no, like not even a, not even a string of doubt because you know that if you do that thing, it's going to draw your attention. Yeah, away yeah, from yeah. The main I thing. think, I think that's definitely right. You have to say no to more things, but you also need to learn how to say yes to the right opportunities that come your way. Cause it's not like, you, know, you don't want to be saying no to every single yeah. thing either. You have to keep an open mind to yeah. things that could be pretty, pretty big. Yeah. But yeah, definitely you, you need to. Yeah, that one's more of a, I feel I have like a more mixed, mixed view on. I don't have like a, like full, like, yeah, for sure. You got to say. I can, I can tell that you're like a phone on do not disturb guy though. Like you have to. Oh, yeah, it's it's always words, dude, we were outside for 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's always. And Martin's like, yeah. I can't even call him. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always on. And it, the, I'm aware that it annoys the shit out of people that I'm always on D&D. But to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's nothing personal against anybody. I literally get like 200 messages a day. You know, I'll get like 50, 60 I messages, a few hundred emails, you know, then Slack. Like, and if, So you just don't answer them? If I don't, I set time when I'll answer things. You really do? Yeah. And like, if I don't control that, then my entire existence is going to be getting back to people. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. So we listen, you know, Alex Hermosi? Yeah. We heard this in the car. We listened to one of his podcasts yeah. and what he did was he didn't have an you have an assistant or no? No. He didn't have an assistant either. And he started responding to text being like, hey, this is Christina, Alex's new assistant. Sorry, Alex is like working on the business right now, trying to make a better service for you. So like anything you need, I can help you with. And like, you just like handed his phone to somebody else and be like, this is your job yeah, now, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of doing. Was literally me too. Like, in the car, I was like, I'm doing this like next week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just if you know me, I'm not answering you. I feel like <laughs> your job your atten- is to answer stuff. Your attention is the most important thing. That's the the, that's the thing, right? And it's, it's nothing, it's really nothing personal against anybody. It's just like, you know, there's a few people that I make sure, there's really only a few people that I make sure to respond like as quickly as I can. And these are, like important executives, some invest, like some investors, some investors, my yeah, favorite some ones. investors who are serious, um, and you know, like customers, you know, f- like customers, I always make sure to respond to. But aside from that, you know, pe- uh, the feedback that I get a lot is that I'm not too, the most responsive person. Like that annoys my friends and annoys a lot of people. But to be honest with you, it's just like. I got so many messages in a day. I have to f- kind of control who I get back to and how quick. Otherwise, if I'm just focused on getting back to people very quickly, that's all I'm doing all day. You yeah, know, and I, I, I have heard some founders say like, "You want to be super responsive," and I'm like, "The fuck! Like, how are you? Like, <laughs> how are you gonna do work? Like, what are What are you doing yeah. all day if all you're doing is just being super responsive? Yeah. Right? Like, like if you're a serious founder, you're getting hit up all the time. If all you're doing is getting back to people, what like? What value are you creating? Yeah. So my question, what are you doing all day then if you're not answering these people? Like like the day, like say for example today, what was the task of the day in a sense? Yeah. So in the morning had a couple of customer calls like important with important groups where like private equity groups where we, we'd be able to onboard like a lot of customers at once. Then after that, I had uh, like a few meetings with our executives and then we had like a big team meeting that was basically just like presenting the review for the week, then came here, met up with you guys. So yeah. The, I get why you don't want to be texting people all day because yeah, like, yeah, you want to yeah. be focused on that private equity meeting that like you can go <laughs> close 30 clients at once in a sense. Yeah, exactly. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, I got one last question. I know, he I, know I said that a couple this. questions ago. He, yeah, he's going to jump out and say, I got to go eat something. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I've been not obsessing, but I've been a big fan of creating systems and process around things as, as any business needs yeah. to, um, and SOPs. Yeah. When you were relative to now, cause I'm sure other people are building those out for you, but relative to like when you were getting started, how do you think through creating a standard operating procedure for something? I'm horrible at that. So I don't do that. In the Same. Company. It's I don't do any of that. Shit. But I do agree with you that it's highly important. I think if you're someone like me, who's not good at it, you need someone like you on the team who's thinking about it constantly. So my co-founder, that's where he excels. 
is basically building systems and processes. That's not my strength at all. Well, he's like typing on Notion and all this other stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what he's about. That's what he loves to do. He was always in Notion. And I remember in the beginning, he was like, put everything you do on the calendar, write down. I was like, dude, like... (laughs) Just <laughs> no, I'm, like, I'm not the biggest fan of it but i i know that it's essential and i know that no one else is going to do it so i have to do it yeah and then yeah. But, and then you get to a point where you can afford to hire someone else who can do it for you and who's better than you at it you know yeah for me the hack was just co-founding with someone yeah. who's good at it i th- i don't think i would have you know yeah no it, it is i agree with you it is really important but i just know it's not my strength for sure yeah I think we'll wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. For everyone who wants to find Parker and all this stuff, what should they do? I'm curious. Follow us on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Follow what's what's Parker's Parker Twitter on, on Twitter? Parker underscore HQ. Okay. Yeah, and then, what's, and then what's you can Twitter? find me just my first name, last name. We'll put it all in the, we'll put it in the description. And the website's getparker.com. Yeah, that's right. So uh, getparker.com slash NMT15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are they going to get? <laughs> an extra 15 days. Now we got 60 days to pay it back. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's going to go viral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Thank no, you, no, thank you th- for coming this on. This was fun, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, this is good. Sure. Cool. Anyways, catch you guys on the next yeah, we'll one. Check the them out. One. Shout out to the sponsor. I don't know who the sponsor yeah. are on this one, but we shout appreciate out to the sponsors. You. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, we got the they sponsors. They will throw it, you know, popped up there'll be like the logos, video there'll be the logos yeah we do it we do it nice for them anyways see you on the next see one you. peace yep